Okay, if we could uh, take our seats and uh, maybe curtail the conversations, we could commence with the July 26th meeting of the, Monitor, of the Fort Ord Reuse Authority. Uh, Lena, can we have a roll call? City of Carmel by the Sea, Mayor Burnett. City of Delray Oaks, Mayor Edelin. Here. City of Marina, Mayor Pro Tem O'Connell. Here. City of Marina, Councilmember Brown. Here. <laughs> City of Monterey, Councilmember Selfridge. Here. Monterey County, Chair Potter. Here. Monterey County, Supervisor Calcagno. Monterey County, Supervisor Parker. Here. City of Pacific Grove, Councilmember Camp. Here. City of Salinas, Councilmember Lutz. Here. City of San City, Mayor Pendergrass. Here. City of Seaside, Mayor Backoffner. Here. City of Seaside, Councilmember Oglesby. Here. 17th Congressional District, Alicarago. 15th State Senate District, Senator Blakesley. 27th State Assembly District, Nicole Charles. Here. University of California, Graham Bice. Here. California State University, Justin Wellner. Monterey Peninsula College, Dr. Garrison. Monterey Peninsula Unified School District, Dr. Shepard. Monterey Salinas Transit, Hunter Harvath. Transportation Agency of Monterey County, Todd Muck. United States Army, Colonel Clark. Here. Fort Ord BRAC Office, Gail Youngblood. Here. Marina Coast Water District, Howard Gustafson. Chair Potter, you have a quorum. Thank you. Please join me in the pledge. Please begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, before I go to Michael for uh, announcements and correspondences and acknowledgments, I just want to note that we will, I suspect, lose a quorum around about 5.30. So, and we do have a closed session we need to address. So if we could just keep that in mind as we move through today's items, I'd appreciate it. Michael? Yes, uh, uh, Chair Potter, members of the board, under acknowledgments and announcements, I think all of the members of the board should have received a copy of the letter a week or so ago from the uh, United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Yeah. There was a follow-up letter that we received us. from the Department of Toxic Substances Control. There are also letters here that pertain to a couple of items on your desk having to do with uh, the... Uh, can you use the uh, Yes, I can. And in fact, uh, is that better for you? All right. Can so you start over, Michael? Yes, I will. In fact, I, there are several letters at your desk, but most importantly, I want to point out that there was a second letter regarding the issues associated with trespass that you will find on the table. Uh, the Department of Toxic Substances Control wanted to be here in person today to deliver the letter, but they have other items that they have to handle in Northern California, so they are not available today. Uh, I did, as the Army is um, an, an integral part of this, this cleanup process. In fact, the Army, US EPA, and uh, the California Department of Toxic Substances Control are the signatories to the decision documents for the, the cleanup project that's addressed in, in, these, in these letters. I did want to want to underline the Army's um, support of the, the land use restrictions that the Reuse Authority has, has put in place. We think it's really important that members of the community honor those restrictions while the cleanup process is ongoing. It's a long process. We have to move through it step by step. Every I has to be dotted, every T has to be crossed, and it takes some time. Even if, even if people have seen work going on on a site, that doesn't mean that we are 100% done. Uh, we can send contractors back, ev even though the Reuse Authority and the Army use the best available technology to do this work. Munitions items are left behind. We know that's going to happen. Our contractors do not give us a 100% guarantee on this work. As long as people honor the restrictions that are in place, the public can use the property appropriately. But we need to emphasize that, that those restrictions are there for a reason. We have a long process to get through, and we want to keep everybody safe while we're doing it. Thank you, Gail. Okay, why don't we move on then to public comment. It's an opportunity for any member of the public to comment on an item uh, that is not on today's agenda or uh, 
items of concern regarding Fort Ord. Good afternoon, board, uh, Mr. Chair and, and board members. Um, I'm here to uh, just comment on a couple items and ask one question. The one question is uh, a few meetings ago I had asked about um, the analysis of job creation and ecotourism and if that was uh, uh, taking place uh, separately from the retention, I mean the reassessment uh, program. I uh, would like, to, I'm very interested to see what those numbers might be uh, in terms of the whole uh, base reuse plan and opportunities for, for jobs. And the second thing is more of a comment uh, in regards to job creation on, on the former Fort Ord. Uh, we know that each jurisdiction is uh, responsible for those lands within their jurisdiction and have complete control over land use uh, decisions there and that our, uh, the consistency determinations will determine whether they, they meet the, the test in terms of uh, the master plan. And um, I would just encourage all the jurisdictions to, to work towards uh, that job creation based on that plan. Uh, it's uh, of supreme uh, importance to our area that we recapture that uh, economic vitality. Uh, so that's basically all I wanted to say, but I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ralph. Is there anybody else wishing to speak today? Okay, seeing no one, I'll close the public comment period, move on then to item number five, which is old business. First is a 5A, which has to do with the modification, proposed modifications to the appeals fee. Michael? Yes, uh, Chair Potter, members of the board, uh, this is an item that was, uh, has been discussed between the Fort Ord Reeves Authority and the Sierra Club predominantly, although there are a number of entities that have expressed their opinion about the reduction of the fee. Uh, in fact, I think recently the County of Monterey has taken some actions with respect to their fee as well. There are two options that are available to the board to act in this regard. One would be to amend the section of the Fort Ord Master Resolution, Fort Ord Reuse Authority Master Resolution, to adjust our consistency determination appeal fee basis and to use an average of the fora jurisdictions land use appeals fees as the basis for doing that. And that is almost exactly the recommendation that we had received from the Sierra Club in the past. An alternative to that would be to amend the same section of the master resolution to al um, allow a tiered appeal fee based on the size of the project and type of project and a waiver to appellants who meet specific low-income eligibility standards um, as might be determined by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, Chair Potter, that uh, is the complete report. Okay, other questions of directors of Michael at this time? Yes, please. Frank. Relating to attachment A to 5A, I noticed in the uh, proposed amendment it, it requires the person to actually pay the fee and then apply to get the money returned to him. But I do not see that in the other section, the word reimbursed. Um, I really don't think it's appropriate to have a person have to pay it first and then seek to get it back. And I'm wondering why that is considered to be a requirement. And secondly, why is only once a year um, if someone could address those? I'll have to uh, think about that for a minute. I'm not sure that the once of the year was uh, required. You mean, in, would you please refer to me to what the where the once of the year comment? Yes, on the uh, attachment A. Yes. The next to the last sentence says the appeal fee may be reimbursed not more than once yearly to an appellant who signs a declaration on the penalty of perjury. I have a question about the penalty of perjury document as well, but it seems like that's limiting a reimbursement to a particular appellant no more than just once a year. That's so, right. So if they apply for uh, or question or challenge something and they pay the fee, does that mean even though their income is low as it was before, they wouldn't be able to get that fee back? That's right. That, that is uh, the, the purpose is to uh, avoid uh, people bringing multiple uh, appeals. In light of this, the paucity of appeals that we've experienced over the years, it seems highly unlikely that anybody would file more than one appeal in a lifetime, let alone in a year. And uh, we've negotiated this with the Sierra Club, who, with whom, uh, fr from whom this uh, section or originated, and concluded that 
it would be reasonable to limit somebody to the subsidized appeal only once a year. Why is that um, not stated in the alternative section? Uh, why is what C. not stated? The word reimbursement. It isn't requiring, number one, a reimbursement, or excuse me, a payment first, and it doesn't limit that I could see once a year. Well, I frankly don't recall. Uh, I don't recall wh why we did it that way. I'd have to go back and look at it. I'm sure if I, when I do, I'll be able to recreate. But I think when we, when we hear from the public, we'll probably get a response to that question. In the meantime, I'll have to go back and reread it. And um, just a couple of more, if I may. When you're referencing the very low income. Are we talking about looking at an adjusted gross income of an individual, or are we looking at a gross income of an individual, or has that been determined? I, I went to the HUD, uh, HUD section on the computer, and it gives three different ways of calculating or determining the income of an individual, one actually being the census over a 10-year period, the other one being the uh, 1040 form, and, and there's another portion. Have we determined which of those three would be used? No, but we were, uh, I think this particular standard is one that's used rather consistently throughout the public agencies on determining um, low, moderate, uh, very low income, and the standards are set by Department of Housing and Urban Development. They regularly update those. It, would, it has to do with eligibility for affordable housing. It's the one standard we know that everyone seems to use consistently. Um, and it does give a broader one for all of us to be able to use. So um, I think if you have a suggestion, um, I think all of us would be willing to use that. But the idea was to set a standard everyone would understand that it's published regularly. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Do I see a show of hands on how many people are expecting to speak on this topic? That's what I thought. <laughs> and Jane, do come forward. But um, you know, I'm willing to give you a little extra time above and beyond the three minutes since we did keep you here one night very late and nothing happened. And you then did stay excessive amount of time on another meeting. And you've done all the hard work on this. So Thank let's you. just don't abuse the privilege. I'm Jane Haynes, representing the Sierra Club, uh, a friend of Dave Potter's. <laughs> Uh, in 1997, Sierra Club sued FORA, and that litigation was settled in 1998 with a settlement agreement that was became Chapter 8 of the FORA Master Resolution. In other words, Chapter 8 is the settlement agreement. And that settlement agreement provided that there would be the reassessment of the base reuse plan, which is currently going on, and it also set this... Um, fee a, a fee for appealing a consistency determination to the same amount that Monterey County Board of Supervisors um, charges for an appeal to the Board of Supervisors. Um, so at that time, the appeal in Mon fee in Monterey County was $252. It was in 1998. Today, it's exactly 20 times that amount. 5,040 is exactly 20 times that amount. Um, well, with regard to the reuse, uh, the, the re uh, reassessment of the reuse plan, last fall, FORA invited representatives from the Sierra Club to come and meet with FORA staff. And we did so. We had monthly meetings, and we asked many questions. All of the questions were answered to our satisfaction. We requested documents. We got every document that we requested for promptly and completely. Um, and when S Assemblyman Monning asked our Sierra Club's opinion about FORA being extended, we unconditionally supported the extension of FORA. And about a month ago, a Sierra Club representative went to Sacramento and spoke to an assembly committee there in support of AB 1614. Um, so in the letter, we wrote about the First Amendment. I want to make it clear that Sierra Club does not think that FORA, FORA, we do not think that FORA is violating the First Amendment. First Amendment says that no legislature can make a law. 
that makes it, prohibits a citizen from um, petitioning the government for a redress of grievances. And the way that FOUR is doing it is a contractual agreement. It is not a board resolution that is doing this. It's the contractual agreement that you have with Sierra Club and that settlement agreement. So it differs than if it had been, say, a board resolution setting this. So it's a contractual agreement, and the, the integrity of a contractual agreement is also protected by the United States Constitution. So we are not saying FOUR is violating the First Amendment to the Constitution. Um, However, the fact that the fee has gotten that high acts as a barrier to do exactly what the First Amendment prohibits. It has raised it to a, an amount that's unaffordable for the great majority of Monterey County residents. Um, and it also, in effect, bars access to the courts because in order to go to the court on a matter like this, it's necessary to exhaust administrative remedies, which means that you have to appeal to the highest administrative authority. And people and organizations just can't do that with this, with this fee. Um, so to address the objections, uh, anyway, um, to, I, I want to address the objections that are stated in your staff report. One is that lowering the fee to this amount, to the averaged amount, might result in frivolous appeals. Well, I don't think there are many people in the world who regard $737 as a frivolous amount. So I think the more valid objection is that it would require for it to spend for us money to subsidize the appeal process. And as we um, explained in our letter, um, there are four projects that we see on the horizon that appear to be possible in the next six years, the time of forest expansion, extension, the Monterey Downs, Cypress Knolls, the city of Monterey's proposed project, that, and um, Del Rio's uh, proposed project. Those are the four that we've been able to see. And as we um, explained in the, our letter, that it would be likely that for a, if if all four projects are appealed, it would be likely that it would cost for roughly $17,000 subsidy for uh, over and above the amount of the $737. Um, so those are the equities that your board needs to balance today. Sierra Club, by the way, it, it's a moot point what the second um, proposal says because Sierra Club will not agree to it. It's a contractual agreement. FORA can't go ahead and, and approve that, um, that um, what do you call it, tiered <coughs> fee increase because we will not agree to it. This is a contract. Um, and, but we would welcome and we very much want that fee reduced to an amount that makes it possible for citizens and organizations to file appeals in what is a principle of American democracy. Um, so um, Sierra Club has been reasonable with FORA, and now we're asking FORA to be reasonable with us. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Is there anybody else wishing to speak? All right, close the public comment period, bring it back to the board for discussion. Board members, your preference? I I guess I might just tee this up from my point of view, and that is that the, the easiest and the cheapest way to get something appealed is to go find one of us directors to appeal something. It doesn't cost anything. Um, that's pretty damn affordable, and based on the diversity of this membership, I think you could find somebody that would have an interest in just about anything that the public might be interested in. So I, I'm going to support the, the average, uh, which is 737.69, um, for the appeal costs, um, and I appreciate the work Jane's done, but uh, if you really wanted to get it done cheap, just find one of us to help you out. It's the cheapest way. Can I second that? I will, I'll make that as a motion then. <laughs> if I may, Mr. Chair? Frank. Briefly. Um, no I'm complicated going to, questions, okay. Uh, no, I'm going to oppose it just for the obvious reasons that I stated that I don't believe that a person of very low income should be required to put up the fee and then ask for reimbursement. I also disagree with the concept of 
very low income. Low income is one thing, but very low is rather uh, difficult to comprehend the person being able to put up any money. Uh, but on the other hand, this declaration on the penalty of perjury, it's been my experience when I uh, represent people in, in court and they don't have the fee that the court system has a very simple, simplified uh, financial statement. I think that something like that should be used as compared to just a mere declaration on the penalty of <coughs> perjury so that the person who is evaluating it could actually look at the uh, financial statement to determine uh, whether or not it's actually something that should be considered. Anyone, and unfortunately, anyone could put together a declaration on the penalty of perjury. A lot of people don't even understand what penalty of perjury means. So I think putting down the numbers would be a better requirement. So under the way it's worded right now, I'll be being opposed. Thank you. Okay. David? Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Potter. I have to agree with Mayor Pro Tem O'Connell. Um, in my experience in the courts as well, the way fee waivers are handled is that when a person uh, has a very low income, uh, that is 125 percent or less than 125 percent of the federal poverty level, they're entitled as a matter of right to a fee waiver and the, the court has very limited jurisdiction. The point is, though, they don't have to front the money and expect a reimbursement, and there's no limitations on uh, how many times, you know, on, on how many times this can be done in terms of limiting it to one year. I, I think it may well be suspect if you ask a very low-income person to pay the 737 and expect to get it reimbursed. Um, it should be automatic uh, just like the court system uh, does. I think it's under government code section 68511.3. Uh, I've dealt with that a lot. And I, I agree with Mayor Pro Tem O'Connell that it should be a simplified process like this. And for that reason only, I won't be supporting uh, this motion. And, and before I go to others for their thoughts, uh, it might be interesting if you had a proposed amending motion that you'd want to bring forward that solved this problem so we didn't have to go back and hear it again next month. You could think about that while we go to, let's say, Supervisor Parker. It looked like she was about ready to speak. Jane, did you have something you wanted to say? Um, I was just going to say that it sounds like there's a, a reasonable uh, concern being raised and uh, potentially a reasonable solution that's not going to you know, uh, change this. I, I am in support of uh, the the average um, fee of uh, 737.69, um, and I wonder, do, would it be prudent, prudent to check in with the Sierra Club to see if they have any concerns about um, this this little tweak to the uh, low income uh, waiver to make sure we're on solid contractual ground with our friends? Uh, well, I have closed the public comment period, and I had to break with tradition and get in a back and forth debate with the public. But on the other hand, it does seem to be Jane only today. So Jane, do you have a thought on this that you'd wish to share? Yeah, it, it, Why don't you go up to the mic, though, since you're being filmed internationally here? It saves staff having to go through learning how they, they do that in, in the clerk's office, in the courts. But it saves for a staff, which doesn't have that expertise right now, of going through the financial statements and so on and so forth. Under penalty of perjury, you know, if, if you think someone's cheating, just sue them once. Have a lot of publicity about what happens to them, and I don't think anyone will sue them again. Um, so that's, that's why we thought that under penalty of perjury would be satisfactory rather than doing it the way the court does it. Thank you, Jim. Okay, are there any other board members with comments or concerns? Ian? I thank the chair. <clears throat> I can tell you, um, you know, uh, I think uh, Jane, and uh, I'll just call her first name, Ms. Hans, uh, made good comments, and I'm glad they brought it forward to, to take a look at this. Uh, towards the end of her comments, though, um, well, I, I won't say that, but towards the end of the comments, uh, it was said that uh, we should be fair to the Sierra Club, as though we have not been fair. Uh, I think we have been fair, and this is a contract, and this is not uh, the court system, so to bring in and say we should do exactly the way the court system think it should be done, uh, then maybe we shouldn't be tying ourselves too close to how the Sierra Club should want it done. We're doing that because we're tied in a contractual agreement. So I don't, I don't think a, a tweaking of this, um, uh, this motion will pass today. 
Uh, I'm just trying to understand, how, are we trying to say that it shouldn't cost anything for the appeal? Uh, I think the citizens should be able to put up some type of money. It's down to seven, 737 and some change, and, and if they certify, they can get that money back. So um, this is a better cost. I, I, it's affordable, it seems to be, and I agree, $700 is a lot of money. Uh, but I think if they can get it back, then 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 that's a good thing too. So we're working together. It's just I don't see how we're going to move the ball all the way to you should be able to do it for free, uh, other than go through the little paperwork and the, and the hoops that we're asking them to go through. Okay, David. <clears throat> it is arguably constitutionally required, as uh, Jane pointed out, that since it's a requirement to seek court review, that one exhausts all administrative remedies. And I think if you don't have any provision for waiving the fee at all, it's constitutionally suspect. You may want to ask Mr. Bowden. He may disagree. Uh, but at this point, I, I, you know, pursuant to your suggestion, Chair Potter, I'd like to make a substitute motion to pass the resolution as amended so as to after the after the word appeal fifth line from the bottom where it says not to exceed the authority's reasonable cost to prepare the appeal after that i would offer suggested wording of the appeal fee shall be waived for an appellant who signs a declaration under penalty of perjury that she as uh, she, she or he qualifies as very low income under low income eligibility standards set by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, and continuing with, the authority board must conduct a public hearing on the appeal within 60 days. All right, well, that's relatively close to what I was going to suggest, which was strictly striking the word reimbursed and putting in the word waived. But I, I don't think that your additional language is, is that burdensome. So, um, Jerry, do you have any opinion on that? All right. Michael, you don't see that as a deal breaker? Did that get a second? Chair, I'll second it, but I have a what question. A Are you deleting the once yearly? Yes. Okay. Second. Okay. Discussion on the uh, new motion, which is a substitute motion, which would take precedent over the main motion. Ian? Uh, Chair, I believe that won't pass today. You're forecasting where you might be voting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Director Lutz. Chair, I, I just wanted to, to check. I realize that the, the seconder of the motion um, obviously agrees to the motion, but, what, but I think Mr. O'Connell brought up um, the idea of not having to sign the penalty of perjury. That seems a little convoluted to me when, when there's already something in place that, that that's probably not necessary and indeed could be cumbersome. Wondered if we could, if I could just ask. Mr. O'Connell about that. No, uh, the document that the court uses, the simplified financial statement is signed under penalty of perjury. I'm just oh. saying that what this is saying is a declaration. A person could write out a declaration under penalty of perjury and not put any numbers in there to show what his income is. And you're sitting there reading it and you say, this person said, I don't have the funds, to, I don't have the money to pay this. Well, okay. you know, my answer to that is prove it. Give me something more okay. than that. Okay. And I don't think this would require that the way it's worded. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Nicole? Yeah, I just have a question. So was the, the, the motion that was made, was it made as an amendment to, to your motion? Just, it was a substitute, substitute motion. Can you, can you tell me what that motion is? Just again, is it the first, is it this year, the tiered approach or the 737 approach with that amendment? Mr. Brown, the maker of the motion. It's the 737 approach with a with some modification as to under, the cir under what circumstances that fee may be waived to a person who meets the financial criteria. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, Jerry. No, no, no. Just a uh, legal question. Or, um, I'm a little confused about, are we legally required to waive for very low income personnel any fee for the appeal? Are we required to do that or are we just doing that out of the goodness of our hearts? Well, uh, no, you're not required to, to do that, but I don't think it's accurate to characterize this as out of the goodness of your heart. It's a policy question as to how far 
the board feels it should go to accommodate uh, its procedures to people who cannot afford uh, substantial appeal fees. And, and let me just state again, this, this is much debate about nothing because you can get it done for nothing by getting right. a director to appeal the item. So we're just kind of talking ourselves in circles here. Um, I don't know when we have a little bit of a short fuse on our time limit today. Ian? And, and I'm going to uh, <clears throat> take your lead on that. And just, just and, and, and I won't waste staff time by bringing this back, but uh, I would say now we're talking about 737 is substantial. We just had our attorney say that's substantial. You know, why do we have this policy at 737 if uh, we're going to allow, uh, uh, if we think it's, it's cumbersome to the, to um, the average citizen, and I mean average citizens, the one that couldn't afford it. Of course, if you can afford it, it doesn't make a difference. But now that now that you put it like that, we're on the record of saying it's cumbersome. Then why but it, pay? But it is based on the average. Having thrown out the high and thrown out the low, it is the average. So it is the norm then, countywide. So yeah. okay. okay, we have a motion. We have a second. We've had extensive discussion. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Ian. Uh, okay, moving on then to 5B, which is the consideration of uh, an appropriate records retention policy. Michael? I think Robert Norris is going to handle this one. Okay. Robert? In May, the board uh, requested that we uh, schedule a discussion regarding the establishment of a records retention policy. And staff uh, for, uh, was charged with going out and looking at what was available. Um, we looked at the current records retention policies of local and regional organizations. And this item has been scheduled to, uh, in response to uh, that direction. Uh, basically, uh, coming from the California Government Code, we looked at an attempt to follow the trend. Initially, that was the Freedom of Information Act, and that morphed into sort of the Individual uh, Privacy Act, and following that was uh, basically a adaption uh, of the uh, State Administrative Manual and also the uh, California Acquisitions Manual regarding property. Uh, the bottom line is that these documents and legislation attempted to provide direction for administrative, fiscal, or legal uh, records and communications. Uh, we surveyed essentially the, the records of almost 45 agencies, uh, and we have that survey indicated in the report. Uh, we looked at specifically email, uh, since that was the hot button, and we, we looked at 18 uh, email retention policies from agencies across the state, and including the uh, records retention policies of uh, the cities of Monterey, Delray Oaks, Salinas Valley Waste Authority, and um, the Monterey Bay United Air Pollution Control Agency. Uh, to get to the, the recommendation that we're making today. Uh, a recommendation uh, basically attempts to focus on the categories of records that are within FORA's operational purview. And attachment B uh, is an effort to codify that into a policy and attachment Rather, attachment A is an effort to codify that into a policy, and attachment B uh, lists the records request to date that we've uh, been asked to respond to, and that supports the uh, second recommendation for additional authorization uh, to expend uh, money for resources or to compensate staff for overtime. Uh, directed in support of records request activity. Uh, we've had almost 51 requests and more coming in each day. 
and that's been almost 300 hours of, of time uh, from various staff associated with it. So our recommendation request today is that the board review and adopt a records retention policy for the Fort Ord Reuse Authority and to authorize for staff to expend up to $15,000 for additional resources to respond to the unanticipated volume and bringing our records into retention policy compliance. Thank you, Robert. Are there any questions of Robert by board members at this time? It, it just one, Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, due to the history that led to this taking place, I'm just curious as to um, would there be a problem with um, addressing this at next month's meeting so that the public would feel that they've had an opportunity to fully look at this? Uh, I don't want this thing to come back and bite us by saying someone says that we rushed it through. I know we paid a lot of attention to it, but uh, I don't know if the public has had the opportunity that they would feel comfortable with. I personally am I'm ready to vote, but I was just wondering. Well, I, I think there was some urgency as far as getting a policy in place that was specific, and I, I, I believe it has been circulated to the public with with appropriate time, even if it was at another meeting. But uh, Felix, do you have? <clears throat> to that end, it would be my take on this that this could be handled iteratively as well. Uh, so we could put this in place and see how it works. Hopefully it works well, because I think a lot of minds have been thinking about this and looking at how other agencies deal with it. But if we find that it's weak in any way, it would seem to me that we can come back and, and revisit it and improve it in the future fairly easily. And you are right. It is a document that could be amended at any time. Um, Jerry? Seeing as how we're asking for another $15,000 that we weren't initially anticipating in our budget to uh, comply with uh, records retention policy and requests, and looking at the two pages of, of, of information requests, which are, which are great, we should be responsive to the public. But in speaking with the staff, large large number of hours being spent just going through documents and trying to pull all this stuff together. Are we, we, we want to be able to charge people that are asking for this enough to reimburse us for our time. We don't want to make it onerous where we're trying to preclude providing information to the public. Are we charging what we need to charge to the public when they ask us for information here to be able to recoup our costs? Yeah. No. Uh, no, we're not, uh, and nor, can, nor may we. Uh, we're not permitted to charge for staff time. However onerous that uh, or burdensome the request may be, uh, the Public Records Act does not permit a government agency to charge for staff time. Other questions? I, I do want to add, though, it, uh, that's part of the answer. The, there is another part of the answer that you should know is that we've always had a policy of charging for certain materials that are reproduced. So there's a certain charge per copy, a certain charge for CDs. When we make them, if we, it's possible, we provide those files electronically so that we don't have to charge. But by and large, uh, when people ask for specific paper copies, or specific, we, we do charge for those. But for our time, no. Jane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I did have a question for Mr. Norris, um, and that was, uh, has the staff had a chance to take a look at this and uh, give you any feedback? I mean, it's about whether they feel it's understandable, um, easy to comply with, um, you know, is it clear to them, confusing? Uh, have you gotten that kind of feedback at all? Yes, staff has, uh, that's, also, that was on a parallel track, Madam Supervisor. Uh, we worked internally to identify uh, what were the categories of records. So in a sense, we followed the recommended guidelines of the uh, um, Secretary of State in inventorying what records we had, what categories we needed to identify and preserve, and then approached it into bringing that together for this policy. And the recommended retention was erred on the side of conservatorship. I think you'll see some places they would do three. In most cases, we went to the median or beyond. Thank you. Well, um, with that, I, I do think um, this is going to be uh, a, a process, a learning process. So uh, I would be supportive 
of uh, going ahead and adopting uh, this policy and um, authorizing the additional expenditure uh, and ask that this be brought back in, say, six months or a year to, with a report on how it's, how it's working and if we need to tweak it in any way. Okay. Um, if you could just hold that thought and perhaps morph it into a motion, I'll see if there's anybody in the public wishing to speak to this item. Is there anybody interested in speaking on this item today? Okay, see no one. We'll bring it back. Jane? You can consider sure. it a motion. Um, I'll, I'll, I may second this in a, in a moment. but under, under discussion, though, let's just see if it gets a second, then we can have a discussion. Is there a second to this motion? Second. Very good. Under discussion. Okay, so under discussion. Um, my, my main concern with this, and I'm fully supportive of establishing this policy. I was, I think, one of the drivers behind this, putting it in writing. Um, but uh, my one concern is sort of on the how it, how the email aspects of it get uh, get actually handled. Uh, there's a, a paragraph uh, marked re method of retention, paragraph E, and it requires uh, quite a lot of uh, human uh, intervention, which I think is very appropriate. Um, but it's not quite described um, how the email that's taken out of the email system and put into the um, put into the file system uh, how that actually happens. Is there is there like a correspondence log that four is going to maintain so that these uh, emails are readily findable? Uh, once it gets put into a file system, it may not be as readily searchable uh, than when it's in an email system. That that is really my only technical concern with this. Uh, and if not, then I think we need to talk about an email archiving solution, in which case the $15,000 may not be adequate unless we go to an open source solution. So there's, I think there's some technical aspects to be discussed here still. Robert. Uh, in, in response to your question, what we're doing now, because we are a relatively small, flat organization, is, is basically doing a search and archive manually. Uh, we will probably have to look at what our experience is and bring it back in a budget solution in, in next year to do what, in effect, most agencies do as an enterprise implementation of it, of your email retention policy. We have to look at what our volume uh, experience will be, what those categories are, and then size that as an, as an implementation request. Right now, it is not as burdensome as it can be, but right now, uh, to answer your question, we're doing it uh, manually with uh, our system. Okay. Any other discussion? Ian? I'll go quick, uh, Chair. My, first of all, I'm the local record retention liaison for my place of work. So I'm comfortable with this. It's a pretty good, strong policy. Uh, anybody can come up to you and say, well, we do something at our place. Let's add that. And that's why a lot of people just go with the state's record retention schedule, and you can see they're, they're missing some gaps. But I want to go to the Public Records Act, which is which of these records can the public come down and request? You're keeping a whole bunch of different documents, but it doesn't say which ones they're authorized to get and which ones they're not. Certain documents there are not. So uh, that's part of it, too, where okay. it should be labeled for staff what, is, uh, what, what can you give out and uh, what can you not give out. And, and, okay, I'm sorry, Lena was reminding me. What we have been instructed and what I'm proceeding on, except for the 28 exemptions identified under the uh, Public Records Act, we, everything is to be provided. Um, I mean, Counselor, that's... Um, no, that's the answer. I, I just think on this, on this schedule, it should put right next to yes. it when the staff is looking at the record, well, yeah, this is know. not allowed to give out, instead of going back and finding right. that page somewhere else. But, right. no, this is a good document. I think the public should be happy, and it can be adjusted any time we want to adjust it. Okay. Bill. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair Potter. Along those lines, and by the way, I would echo the question on email, and for all of us drowning in uh, junk plus intermixed with some really important stuff, uh, I, and I personally haven't found a way to sort it out other than a lot of manual intervention. The, um, the one area of question I had was internal documents, memos, uh, current year plus five years. Now, my understanding is that certain types of memos and internal documents are not, um, not available under public records requests because they're considered working documents. 
is there any way we can distinguish the the keepers from the the working documents in the policy i i think that's a question all right <laughs> Robert, did you hear the question? <laughs> okay, as as I understand your question, what we've anticipated is that the authors of or keepers of those of that information, if a question comes up right now, um, uh, Member Kemp, we have to, we we have to review it and and answer that. I can't. We try to fully anticipate it in trying to create the log so that we at least trap it within an area. But um, the staff has learned that communications that are uh, around decisions that ratify certain actions that document and so forth are to be retained. And if there's any question, seek an answer from legal counsel before destroying them. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that policy is in place. Moving on then to the second vote on the budget and rates for 12 and 13 of the Ford Community Water and Wastewater System. I believe we have a Marina Coast representative somewhere here. Oh, there was, you are. I was going to uh, um, give some context. Steve, you can frame it. If I can find my glasses. <laughs> Getting that one. Uh, members of the board, uh, this is a second vote on this item, and uh, I just wanted to uh, give a brief overview of uh, actions that the board took at the last meeting during the first vote. The, the vote was a plurality in favor, but as it did not receive a uh, unanimous consent, it comes back for a second vote. The board did add language to the previous staff recommendation, although it was taken from the body of the previous staff report where staff recommended the addition of the following language, no additional or community resources should be used to further the regional desalination project unless expressly authorized by the FORA board. So that was added to the motion and uh, would be included uh, tonight as well. The board also under uh, you'll see under discussion under the July 26 agenda number 5c item in the staff report additional five points that the board asked be included in the rationale behind uh, the, the uh, decision to be made and uh, they go to uh, to some extent uh, what I just read out and uh, the actual uh, uh, approval of the resolutions, et cetera. But uh, to the extent that 4I has direct control over some of these items, I would direct your attention to number three, that uh, we were directed to have the Water Wastewater Oversight Committee, which is a 4 uh, uh, or committee, to look at future capital improvement projects to ensure that expenditures are facilitating new development as it occurs in an appropriate manner. Uh, and uh, that would be included to the WWOC work plan uh, if this item passes tonight. And uh, in addition, uh, we were asked to agendize an informational item uh, regarding uh, the annexation process that Marina Coast Water District uh, would be making uh, in addition to having encouraged them to uh, expedite that process. and. Uh, tentatively uh, to be uh, scheduled for the next board meeting, but it could be set at uh, whatever appropriate time. So those are uh, the changes from uh, what the item looked like last month or at the last meeting. And uh, Kelly Cariente uh, is here to make a brief report from Marina Coast Water District. Thank you, Steve. Chair Potter, members of the board, thank you for um, the opportunity to come back and uh, give some brief explanations uh, to some of the and responses to some of the questions and concerns that were brought up at last uh, board meeting on J uh, July 13th. With regards to rates, there was a question uh, or statement made about the um, number of protests needed 
for the uh, rate uh, increase uh, to be stopped or not happened. Um, we issued the mailing in April 2011, and we reported last year that the district received 553 protests prior to the, um, the joint hearing that we had last year. Uh, we uh, received um, more at that hearing for a total of 642. However, there was 1439 uh, protests needed in order to prevent the rate increase from happening. Um, so we wanted to, to clarify that. Um, there was a question on why Marina Coast uh, Water District does not offer discounted rates. And um, I had explained previously that um, as a public nonprofit um, using public funds, we can't subsidize other people's uh, rates um, like a private, privately held utility such as AT&T or, or PG&E. Um, here in this area, uh, no uh, public utility has uh, discounted rates for, for water. Um, Seaside Municipal does not. Um, Soquel uh, Creek does not. Castroville does not. Uh, all public um, health entities cannot subsidize, subsidize rates with other, other users' fees. So that's, that's the reason why Marina Coast does not either. Um, MRWPCA does not for the uh, treatment of the sewer either. Uh, one um, other thing we wanted to clarify on the um, monthly water rate comparison is that this is based on 13 um, HCF, that that is, we have to apply that to everyone's rates. So if your use isn't 13 HCF, that's uh, Marina Coast average um, use, use amount. And so when you apply that even amount, of water to each rate, this is what you come up with. So um, if we came up and used a, a different amount, HCF 5 or 2 or whatever, yes, those amounts would change, but it's based on um, the constant use for our district. Also, um, of the users who pay the capital surcharges, that where were they located? Uh, that was a that was one of the questions brought before um, the board by the public. And um, these are basically all the, the uh, users or connections made after 2005. So you're looking at uh, the dunes development here and um, the uh, new development for CSUMB or the Army. If, um, but there's approximately 325 uh, capital surcharge that are assessed to capital surcharge. Uh, concerns were raised um, regarding um, Preston Park having to pay uh, rate increases when when they um, their si their system they felt was not uh, old, but they're having to pay rate increases to cover an aging system. They are connected to the aging system, um, and so th they would also be um, responsible to to help fund it or the repairs of it. Um, in relation to expenditures, uh, one of the um, uh, concerns was raised about our, sta our staffing levels, and we did reply uh, that you know we do um, run a lean machine, <laughs> so to speak. That if uh, w you compare us to other water districts that of our size, that we um, we do uh, a great deal with the staff that we have. Uh, the the board of Marina Coast asked for a reorganization, and we have eliminated three management positions and a staff position over um, the past year. Um, so uh, Marina's uh, staff and board is very uh, conscientious about their staffing levels and trying to provide the service at the most reasonable cost. Um, as far as the 2% personnel uh, cost adjustment that's uh, budgeted, the um, we're just reiterating that it, it is not a COLA and it's um, just an allowance so that we can, or our, our board, if they so choose, can uh, implement um, part of the compensation study that's to be uh, completed early on um, this fiscal year. And it is similar to the action that was taken by the four board last fiscal year for their staff. So um, 
it, it's very similar to taking that action. Um, the, there was a request to remove uh, a CIP uh, project which uh, tied the regional um, project to the potable system and that has been removed. Um, and then there was a question on uh, the reserve footnote regarding the 7.6 million uh, loan from Ward Water uh, to the regional pro project and um, we originally expected that to be reimbursed through project financing. If the project was going through, it would have already been uh, reimbursed. So um, that was the question, and that's all I can speak to about that item. <laughs> um, there was also a question on amount of dollars spent on consultants and attorneys by Marina Coast, and I'm going to need a little uh, more detail on, on that request because uh, the way, just the way that person uh, posed it. So um, I can get back to that person. I'll have to uh, find out from staff. Uh, regarding the five-year capital improvement plan, there was concern regarding the significant amount of CIP um, in the out years. And uh, as we had stated before, that the district's plan is coordinated with the four plan and um, that it's updated every year. So, you know, based on need or anticipated development or resources, that's when, um, you know, tho those uh, projects would take place. Um, also, our new... Uh, our next rate study, which we are going through an RFP at this at this time, um, that will help address any financing options and give this you know board a um, uh, chance to see how um, those would be financed in the next five years. So, um, and then lastly, there was um, a lot of um, concern regarding the annexation efforts of the district. Um, so far, uh, the district has uh, completed the environmental documents last fiscal year. They were distributed to the public and received many comments. Um, the district staff has also met with LAFCO, and they are in process of updating its municipal service review, and they got approved for that um, to start beginning this summer. Um, that review is required um, prior to consideration of any annexation applications. So we're working with um, LAFCO, and they're updating their uh, their request and their, rec um, if you want to say, punch list or our checkoff list for us to um, start that process. So that's where um, we stand right now in our annexation efforts. There'll be a full report on the process and where we stand through the process. I think at the uh, it was requested at the next meeting. So with that, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Or thank, you, thank you, Kelly. I appreciate you taking the time to do all those uh, reconnaissance efforts on the questions that were asked. Uh, are there any additional questions for Kelly at this time? Jill? And, and I, I apologize to everyone because I haven't been in contact with Dennis on this, but I just have to get a couple um, clarification uh, answered. Um, and this is the problem with being the alternate. There coming in in the middle of the conversation. Um, but from reading the staff report, it looks like that there was an increase of 10% two years ago and then another increase of 10%. Is that correct? The, the increase was 5% last year and 5% this year, or actually. 4.9 last 4 .9. year, 5% okay, this year. And that's, sorry. And that's, and that's due to the fact that the assessment that was done said there needed to be a significant amount of work done to the system. Okay. And so instead of doing it in one fell swoop, they did it incrementally over the course of a few years. Okay, so, so then following up on that, um, what is the benefit to the ratepayers beyond, I mean, beyond fixing the aging system, what else are they paying for? Or is that all? Well, they're paying for the operations of the system. And also, um, there are some debt service that was for um, future development that didn't happen. Um, that leaves the rate payers, the rate base having to pay for that. So the rate payers are paying for the debt service of a development that never happened? I mean, I'm wondering or why, why do they have to pay that? They, the district or the, when we issue bonds, we have to pledge the, re the user fee revenues to obtain the funding. 
part of the funding that was used was to um, uh, repair the infrastructure and to um, put in um, new infrastructure for uh, developments that were coming. And at the time, they were coming, but then they did not materialize, so we're left with paying for that. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions before I go to the public? Justin? It's a simple question. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the PowerPoint. I is there any possibility we might be able to get a copy of it somehow? I didn't it's see it on. It's we're, we're oh, I'm it. sorry. It's, it's not on dice, but it's on that table. Great. Back. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Jane? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, uh, thank you, Kelly, for your mm -hmm. presentation. Uh, you mentioned that the, um, the tie-in of the regional desal uh, to the existing system had been removed from the budget, but it's still in the budget that's in my packet, and it's still on the sheet that's in front of me. So um, I'm not sure how it gets removed, on if it's still there. Um, so on the on sheet that the sheet that's in front of us, it's the uh, second page of uh, budget. Uh, it's the capital improvements project summary sheet. It's the f first thing on the list. Is and it page eight? Uh, there are no numbers on the sheets that I have in front of me. Okay. Are you talking about the capital improvement plan? Okay. Ah. And not the budget. Thank you. Okay, why don't I see if there's anybody in the public wishing to speak to this item today? Denise Turley, Preston Park. Um, so I would like to ask, first of all, the um, I had two questions last time that were asked that were not answered, so I'm going to ask them again. Um, yet this presentation is missing the chart that I specifically asked about. It was a chart. Uh, th with three lines, there was a, th and there were three different colors, and I asked who specifically, or if you can't disclose, who, where specifically had the highest rate, the middle rate, the lower rate on that previous chart. Um, you're saying that you can't subsidize um, rates, but um, is there ever an instance where you would, in fact, w waive part of a fee due to the discussion we had earlier um, for um, extremely, um, uh, someone extremely disadvantaged. Um, we want to bring to the attention that Mr. Gustafson made a comment last time about the city of Marina having to vote on something that was brought before the Marina City Council. The staff will be sending you a letter saying that, in fact, they don't have that. The, our attorney, city attorney, said that that's not true. And if that agreement exists on your hand, they're going to ask for it to be sent to them to look at it. Switching to, um, um, uh, regardless of whether or not the 2% is a COLA or not a COLA, all of you county and city people have had to go through the very painful process of asking for cuts in salary from your folks, not being able to give them raises. And I have to say again that, um, I, you know, just shaking my head, um, over n oversight means saying no when, when necessary. And in regards to the um, annexation, Perhaps you need to um, vote no this time, and if annexation does move along this summer, then you can vote yes next year. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others wishing to speak? Okay, I'll bring it back to the board for discussion. Close the public comment period. Uh, is there board direction? Nancy. Yes. 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 And that's the billable hour. It's not the actual wage hour, the rate. These are our billable hours, the, 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 the rate uh, schedule you have here. It's not 
the wage um, salary for the employee. That includes, that's total compensation, and then the billable amount we would have to bill um, out for services. a loan from the ORD reserves to the regional project. Okay, so. So it would be paid by the Correct. Jerry. Okay, I'll take a stab at a motion. Um, I move that we uh, t that take a second vote on adoption of resolutions 12-6 uh, and 12-7s, adopting a uh, compensation plan and setting rates, fees, charges for former uh, Fort Ord base-wide water and sewer services. Uh, this includes adding the following text to the uh, resolution, no additional or community resources uh, should be used to further the regional desalinization project unless expressly authorized by the four board. Okay, we have a motion, do we have a second to that? I'll second it. Discussion? Justin. First, I wanna thank staff. Um, for adding that additional language in there and working with four board, particularly in regards to the, the oversight committee in, when it re in, in regards to the capital improvement and looking at out years as well as annexation. That said, I did wanna kind of provide some additional information that we didn't share last time. Um, our utilities folks have kind of estimated that the ORC community, the increase of the rates would be about 220,000. <laughs> That's what he had projected. And when that came to the university itself as a rate payer, we would be paying an additional 65K. And please know that while we respect that, we are at a very dire situation right now in the CSU. And we've taken unprecedented cuts, which is about to be about a million in the CSU um, in the last several years. And we anticipate a possibility of an additional 250 this fall if a ballot initiative doesn't happen. And so we're very, very conscious and concerned of additional rate increases right now. And as such, we would greatly appreciate those board members who opposed the resolution last month to maintain their position and any others that wish to switch their vote. Thank you very much. Okay, any other discussion? Jill. Well, <clears throat> I, I too feel a little troubled by this because I feel like there's some questions that haven't been answered. And um, I, I, on the 2% cost adjustment, I do understand that's going into a reserve until there's a study being done. Is that correct? A uh, salary comparison study? That is correct. Okay. But I, I'm, what I'm troubled by is the question that was also the, the point that was brought up by, by um, I didn't catch your name, but the woman um, from Preston Park, um, because it, in in my city, and I think think I can probably speak for most of us, that our employees have all taken cuts, and uh, and there's no time in the foreseeable future that any of our employers are getting their their pay. Um, reimbursed. Um, we've looked at this at the uh, Salinas Valley Solid Waste Authority, looking at um, uh, pay increases, and it's just, I think, very uncomfortable for any of us to be giving pay increases in one group when we can't give it to our own jurisdictions. So um, for the questions that I had, uh, questions that others brought up, the impacts, and the fact that 642 protests were made, I think that's a pretty significant amount. When we look at, um, in our own city, when we're looking at maintenance and assessment districts and we get, of course, we always get protests, but they're in the single digit numbers. And when I'm seeing huge numbers like this, uh, just uncomfortable and would, would oppose the motion. I would like to clarify that um, out of those uh, protests, 517 are all CSUMB. David. Thank you, Chair Potter. As Mayor Pro, Pro Tem O'Connell and I discussed last time, we, we hope that, that the board will not approve this as long as the board keeps giving the Marina Coast Water District increases every year. There will never, in my opinion, be annexation. Right now, not even every resident of the city of Marina gets to wo vote for the water district. And my understanding from when I was on the water board was the current directors want to keep it that way. When we were talking about this in 2001, and the, the uh, discussion went something like this, well, I guess we'll have to finally do it when, uh, 
when four of sun sets. Well, I guess uh, if we keep agreeing to these water rate increases, they won't move on annexation until, until 2025. Um, we, I, I wish that those of you who supported it, the last vote would reconsider. Um, consider Preston Park. Preston Park has new infrastructure, yet they're being charged uh, for the infrastructure of the extra infrastructure costs of the rest of Fort Orr. Why? Because they don't get to vote. And this doesn't, af doesn't just affect Marina. It affects Seaside, Seaside Highlands, for example, and unincorporated areas of the county as well. Um, and so I would urge you to, those of you who voted for this, to please reconsider. Thank you. Okay, any other discussion or comments? Jane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've been um, uh, s struggling with this because I, um, I, I have great concern for existing users subsidizing future development um, with no mechanism for them to be repaid. Um, and so um, I also understand the dilemma that uh, Marina Coast Water District has been put in by needing to put pipe down when roads were being built so they didn't have to go back and dig the road up later to put their pipes down, um, which is why I really uh, w want the Water Wastewater Oversight Committee to uh, look at those out years um, and, and help us be a little more thoughtful so we don't put Marina Coast in this uh, position. Um, another thought I had um, is, you know, we at Fora put Twenty-some million dollars into a fund to help with the capacity charges uh, down the line, so that they wouldn't be so high. I wonder if we shouldn't look, because capacity charges um, are somewhat down the line in terms of timing. Uh, I wonder if we shouldn't look at that allocation of twenty-some million dollars uh, and see if there isn't a way to help offset the costs that the current ratepayers are having to bear for the infrastructure that really has gives them no uh, direct benefit. Um, so I uh, am going to change my vote. I voted in favor last time. I will be voting against the motion this time. Any other discussion? Um, Director Edelin mentioned that he was under the impression that at the previous vote <laughs> the 2 percent set aside had been deleted. I don't yeah. know if that's correct or at, not. At the last meeting, unless, unless I'm fantasizing about it, I made a motion that included the 2% set aside, and the motion uh, did not carry, and, and uh, uh, Director Bachhoffner made the same motion without the 2%, and it, and it passed. Right. It was not the uh, way it went. I, <coughs> I think I made those comments as to whether it passed or not, I don't recall. Um, and it's too bad that we don't have the, the minutes from that meeting What's to that refresh our memory. Okay. I don't remember anything. I, I would like to, uh, uh, assuming we don't have the, uh, the, the minutes, I'd like to amend my motion, uh, basically to deleting the 2% uh, set aside uh, and keeping the motion the same without the 2% set aside. Okay, that being the 2% for the wage increase if the compensation study said it was, in, it was due. Okay, so we have, and I'll accept that as a seconder. Okay, so we have a motion, we have a second. Um, I think we need a roll call vote on this. Lena? Aye. No. No. Aye. No. Mayor Pendergrass? No. Mayor Bachoffner? No. Council Member Elder? No. Eight, eight, three, no loser, eight. So the motion fails. Um, the budget is not approved and will need to be brought back a subsequent meeting in a, another form because they'll need a budget at some point. Okay, and I think the comments made um, are such that uh, if staff can uh, get those uh, comments made, um, 
in writing to Marina Coast. I know we have representation here, but I think we want to make sure they understand what the issues are as they go back to try to redress the uh, budget. Okay, we now move on then to uh, 5B, which is uh, the second vote on the denial of the tort claim um, by uh, Keep Forward Wild. Jerry, where did you go? Well, a, a higher authority is summoning you now. <laughs> uh, the uh, the staff report for item 5D is before you, and uh, it's very short. And uh, it speaks for itself. And if anybody has any questions, I can amplify. But I don't need to add anything to what is in that uh, less than one page staff report. Uh, just a, a question. I mean, my concern last time was that I didn't want to appear uh, by um, denying the claim to be saying that I thought that any of the expenditures uh, were fine since we didn't have anything to tell us that they were. Um, and I had asked a question then about how these, these tort claim things work, that it's my understanding that you don't have to take the action to deny, that after a certain period of time it's assumed that you deny it if you, if you don't respond. So I wonder if, if uh, we can, and there was not a lot of clarity about that process last time. Is there a roadmap? Well, I, I, I wouldn't agree, uh, far be it for me to disagree, but I think what you have uh, before you about the propriety of the uh, expenditures that are, that are listed under the discussion is a statement that several auditors, four in number, have found these expenditures to be correct. The way it works is that uh, in your jurisdiction, as well as FORA and every place else, is that uh, the question whether an expenditure is proper or improper is an, an accounting issue. And it's whether the expenditure is, is uh, considered under standard accounting procedures to be uh, a legitimate business expense. And uh, the uh, opinion has been that these uh, expenditures that are listed in the claim are proper business expenses. Thank so you. you have that. Thank you. Um, and I'll make my own determination about that. I, what my question was, was what are the options for this board in terms of denying this claim? Do we have to take a vote to deny the claim, or will it be deemed to be denied if we do not respond? Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, uh, uh, Council Member Brown uh, rendered an opinion last time that it was automatically denied if not uh, uh, if not affirmatively denied in advance, and I have not checked on that. I, uh, the, the question before the board is whether you want to uh, want to accede to this claim or not. Not whether it'll be automatically denied, but. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Okay. We, this is the second vote. I don't think the subject matter's changed, nor the questions around it. Um, it would seem appropriate then if we had a motion um, of some sort, that would be a help. It's a second vote. Previous mo motion was to deny the claim. Um, do we have a motion to that effect? Yeah, I move we deny the claim submitted by the Keep Forward Wild on June 8th, 2012. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed? Okay, we have Lutz and Parker dissenting. Okay, briefly on item 6A, the for a reimbursement policy. If anybody in the public is really not interested in this issue, you could probably start moving out of the room because we have a closed session immediately after this item. Uh, we're not, well, we have an executive option. Oh, that's right. We're going to the other room. You're right. My mistake. Reimbursement policies first. Right. Uh, that's it. Okay, members of the board, on uh, item 6A, uh, one way of looking at the, uh, the previous issue and this issue uh, is to make a distinction between uh, the policy aspects of an overall expense reimbursement policy and uh, the previous action taken uh, by the executive committee 
and confirmed by the board regarding uh, the appointing of a forensic auditor and uh, creation of an ad hoc committee that uh, will be looking at uh, the specifics of uh, the uh, expense reimbursements. So if we can make that distinction between specific actions that will be reviewed uh, in great detail regarding uh, the uh, appropriateness or even legality of any previous expenditures, that will take place in a uh, different forum. But in terms of actually uh, putting together a FORA expense reimbursement policy, which was requested by the executive committee, I've laid out a protocol, a, a process by which we could uh, begin to add that to a work plan and uh, do that work. And just to uh, uh, summarize the recommendation, what we would be doing would be adding a uh, line item essentially uh, into the forensic and annual audit contracts that would allow for review of a FORA expense reimbursement policy. You would be directing staff to compile uh, member jurisdiction expense reimbursement practices. We would bring that back to the ad hoc subcommittee and finance committee to review those practices and get direction regarding the development of a revised expense reimbursement policy. And uh, ultimately, uh, I am suggesting that we also have that draft policy reviewed by the forensic and annual auditors so that we can get a second and even third opinion and uh, ultimately bring the policy back to the board for approval. So that would be the protocol that uh, is suggested for the policy side of the expense reimbursement poli uh, practices. And I just uh, go through a series of ways of, of looking at the kinds of information that uh, we would be analyzing and, and uh, the kinds of decision-making processes that one would go through to look at different types of expenses, the types of distinctions that are made. I can answer any questions regarding uh, that. Are there uh, any questions by directors of Steve well. at this time? Okay, is there anybody in the public wishing to speak to this item? Can I bring it back to the board? Board, your preference? Thank you, Chair Potter. I, um, I think the approach sounds very reasonable. Uh, Mary Edelin and I have been in touch with forensic auditors and are seeking their inputs, leading to ideally a letter of engagement in the very near future. Uh, procedurally, we're going to have to ask a few questions about how to actually commit the dollars. Um, but we've talked to a couple people who sound like they're very, very competent, understand these kinds of issues very well, uh, really understand the interaction between both the expense policies themselves and the business controls that are required to implement them and uh, would likely have recommendations as a result of their audit. Uh, and ideally, we would then take those recommendations, implement them in policies that are suitable uh, to the board. So that would be kind of the approach that I, I would personally endorse, and I think that's consistent mm -hmm. with what we have in front of us at the moment. Sounds like a motion to me. And, and I'm very pleased to see that your own report of your de demise did not come to fruition. You're actually here with us again and will be for a while. Congratulations. Glad to see <laughs> wisdom prevailed. So we have a motion by uh, uh, Kemp, seconded by Parker. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, executive officer's report briefly. Yeah, this, this. Potter, members of the board, there's just one item here. Uh, Lena Spillman has done uh, an excellent job in communicating with the board about the fact that there is a, a new procedure that would permit members of the public to submit comments to uh, the Fort Ord board members. I know many of you use your personal email uh, for certain items, and so we've set up a special uh, way to do that. It's called board at fora.org, and that's not B-O-R-E-D, it's B-O-A-R-D, <laughs> at fora.org. Um, that would allow members of the public to communicate with the members of the board, and we think this would uh, facilitate some of the questions that we are sometimes getting at staff with then a request to then forward it to the board, and I know sometimes that can be onerous for all of you, and so this would uh, not increase the amount of uh, communications, but it would make it simpler for the board. Jane. Not a question, but uh, a comment and thanks. I noticed that we did receive a couple of letters um, 
in the last week or so uh, kind of following this pattern and I really appreciated being able to see those you know before the meeting and all of that so thank you uh, are there any director reports at this time Okay, we are going into closed session. Council, would you report the reason why we're going into closed session? Then I'll ask if there's any public comment on that, those issues. Uh, the reasons are listed under item nine in the agenda, namely uh, consultation with legal counsel about three pending lawsuits, the two Keep Fort Ord Wild lawsuits and the new City of Marina versus Fora uh, pertaining to Preston Park. And secondly, a conference with legal counsel on anticipated litigation, uh, two cases. And I was wrong. We apparently are going to the closet across the hall. Uh, chair, just. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to the, four, we're, the four conference room so that the. Uh, but I did want to note for the. Representatives from Marina, with respect to these items, one does include Marina. So we would ask the board if we would take the four items that would be non-Marina items first. So that would be facilitate the participation of Marina reps. Remembering we have a limited time. Yes. 